So we just finished talking about an idioventricular rhythm, and in an earlier class we talked about ventricular tachycardia. But what do we call it when it's, I mean, idioventricular is a rate of, you know, 15 to 40. And a ventricular tachycardia doesn't start until we're at a rate over 100. So what do we call it when it's at 41 to 100? It's too fast to be an escape rate. It's too slow to be a tachycardia. So we're going to call it an accelerated idioventricular. Now, I know in practice there are times that you will hear people refer to it as a slow VTAC, but it is technically an accelerated idioventricular. It is a regular rhythm. R to R to R to R is regular. As with other ventricular rhythms, we are not going to see that P wave in front of it. If we do see a P wave, it may be dissociated after the QRS because, again, everything's depolarizing from the bottom and going through the heart in a backwards or a retrograde fashion. Because it originates in the Purkinje's of the ventricles, you're going to see that wide, bizarre QRS, and you're usually going to have all those secondary ST and T wave changes. That's just part of the ventricular beat. So usually we abbreviate it IVR. But as I mentioned before, sometimes you will hear people refer to it as a slow VTAC. Um, so on this example here, this first one, I have QRS to QRS to QRS to QRS to QRS to QRS is regular. If this is a six second strip, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, so a rate of 60. I have no P wave in front of it, but my QRS, now my QRS goes up, it comes back down, and it looks like it notches directions or changes directions right there. So it looks like I am one, two, three boxes at least, so 0.12. And again, I have secondary ST and T wave changes. It goes in the opposite direction, usually of my QRS. So this would be idioventricular, but because my rate is a normal rate, it's a rate of 60, I'm going to call it accelerated idioventricular. Now this next example here, it's showing it to you in two leads. And it looks like here I have a regular QRS to QRS to QRS looks regular. My rate is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so rate is 70. No P wave in front of it, but my QRS, it looks like it leaves the isoelectric line and starts to go up here, comes back down, and it looks like it notches or changes directions there. So from here to here, looks like you're a good three boxes. Looks like you're, and again, your QRS is going up and down, so it's hard to see the secondary ST changes, but it's still, you have a wide QRS. Now, when we talked about having the potential of having a junctional rhythm with a bundle branch block, this one here is going to get a really tricky with it. Because when you're looking at an accelerated junctional rhythm, you're looking at rates of what the junction would normally fire at, um, but it's just that QRS is wide. So again, one of the things you need to ask yourself when you're working on a monitored floor, you get more than just a six second strip to look at. That machine's going to run you out a nice strip. Have, did you have a bundle branch block before this started? And now the bundle branch block still looks exactly the same. I've just lost my P wave. Then I might lean towards a junctional rhythm with a bundle branch block. But if you didn't have a bundle branch block before and now you go into this rhythm, it's going to be an idioventricular. Now this is kind of an interesting strip. Here you can see from QRS to QRS to QRS to QRS to QRS is regular. In six seconds I have one, two, three, four, five, six, so rate of 60. No P wave in front of it. My QRS goes up, it comes down, it goes back up and comes down, so it's very wide. Um, and actually my this is probably here, my QRS right here, and this is probably where it's just changed over into the ST and T wave sec section. So it looks ventricular in origin, but it's a rate of 60. So it would be an accelerated idioventricular. But then what happens, so this is a continuous strip that's running through. I still go in regular, regular, and then it looks like I go into this. It looks like I have what looks like three beats of a VTAC, and then I go into a ventricular fibrillation. So it's kind of cool to actually just see this progression of what happened to this patient. So I've got accelerated idioventricular here. I've got three beats of a VTAC here. And then it looks like I'm into a coarse ventricular fibrillation here. So when we're looking at accelerated idioventriculars, um, heart attacks are very common, especially our inferior MIs, because those really tend to impact the ventricles. It can be re a reperfusion rhythm after a thrombolytic ther therapy or an angioplasty. 
ditch toxicity. But the therapy is really going to be rate dependent and it's going to depend on the symptoms. If you have a normal rate, um, possibly the person may not even be symptomatic, even though it is ventricularly based. And we said with ventricular rhythms, you know, they're, they're, they're de depolarizing, the heart's depolarizing from bottom up. So it's not as an efficient of a contraction. So they may or may not have symptoms with this. So it's really difficult sometimes when you're talking about an accelerated idioventricular, you're talking about a rate of 41 to 100. If we use suppressive therapy, we're going to make it slower and wipe it out. So the best treatment is always going to be to try to find and treat the cause. Sometimes it's transient, meaning it can kind of go in and out of it. And so if it's in a normal rate range and they're tolerating it well, we're going to try to find the cause. If they're not tolerating it, then they'll usually look at it. If it's in the rate of 50s, 60s, they'll still go ahead and give something to speed it up. If it's in the, in the higher range, let's say it's in the 90s, they could potentially use um, an antiarrhythmic, but they might have the pacemaker on standby. So this is kind of an unusual um, rhythm for treatment, and usually best treatment is going to just try to be to try to find and treat the cause.